to, uh, to have our next uh, panel that's going to talk about a very timely issue, and that is the strain and toll that um, financial and monetary assessments and obligations, fines, uh, and fees create within the system. This is one of those one of those things that I think, uh, along with uh, a number of other uh, forces within the criminal justice system, have long been overlooked, and its impact upon defendants and their rehabilitation is uh, is often completely. Uh, invisible to our eyes until somebody points out the the issues and problems uh, that in fact exist and we're very fortunate to have a wonderful panel that's going to discuss that with us and moderating the panel is Nicole Austin Hillary from the Brennan Center and I'll turn the matter over to Nicole's capable hands Good morning. I'm so happy to see so many of you here this morning to discuss what is such an important topic um, as we are in this vital period where we are talking about how we strengthen our criminal justice system, how we reform it, how we make it more fair and equitable. So I'm very pleased to be here this morning with this wonderful panel. Uh, again, I'm Nicole Austin Hillary. I'm the director and counsel of the Washington office of the Brennan Center for Justice. Uh, we are a national legal advocacy think tank that works on issues of democracy and justice. And we like to do what we call fix those broken parts of our systems of democracy and justice. And this issue of fees and fines is indeed one of those areas that we cover. Um, I'm so pleased to be joined this morning by this wonderful panel, and I will just do a very brief introduction of each of them because I want us to get right into to this very timely discussion. Um, on the panel, immediately to my right, uh, and I didn't do this on purpose, is my colleague at the Brennan Center, Lauren Brooke Eisen, uh, whom we lovingly call LB. LB is senior counsel in our justice program here at the Brennan Center, and she specifically focuses on the issue of fees and fines and has been doing some tremendous research uh, and has a report that she is working on uh, dealing with this issue. So uh, LB is really going to talk to us about how the research is helping to inform uh, what is being done to advocate around this issue of fees and fines. Next to LB is Alec Karakatsanas. Alec is the founder and executive director of the Civil Rights Corps here in Washington, D.C., and works very intensely on litigation around fees and fines issues. So we'll be talking to us about some of that litigation uh, and how it has been shaping up. Next to Alec is Blake Strode. Blake is a Scadden Fellow and staff attorney at Arch City Defenders in St. Louis, where he works very closely with clients on the ground who have been facing uh, issues of fees and fines that have been impacting their lives within the criminal justice system. So he'll be able to talk to us firsthand about what it means to represent clients who are facing these issues. And last but certainly not least, and in many ways most importantly, uh, is one of Blake's Blake's clients, uh, Kiana Williams. Uh, Ms. Williams is an impacted person and civil advocate at Arch City Defenders in St. Louis, and she is going to be able to give us some of her firsthand uh, knowledge uh, and information about what it is like to be someone in the justice system who is dealing with fees and fines issues and how that has impacted her life. Uh, so uh, I'm so pleased to have them all here and to welcome you here with us this morning. Um, we're not going to do what often typical panels do, even though all of these people are super knowledgeable and could give you a five to seven minute treatise uh, on, on their areas of expertise. We're going to actually have a conversation because we think that's so important. Um, so I'm going to start with you, LB, and ask you to do this for us. 
just give us a good idea of what this whole issue of fees and fines is and what it means to the criminal justice system, and particularly how it relates to mass incarceration. Uh, you know, that is the link that we're trying to make here this morning. And we all know there's a great deal of focus on ending mass incarceration, what we need to do to end mass incarceration. And there really is a direct link between the fees and fines issue and mass incarceration. Help us to understand um, the overview of this issue and how they relate. Absolutely. I think it's on. Start talking. So, in the last few decades, court fees and fines have proliferated, and I, I work at the Brennan Center, and we've been trying to expose this issue for a number of years by writing reports and talking to the media um, and advocating on this issue. What's happened is that our criminal justice system has grown so quickly and so fast that the courts have needed to raise revenue by charging these fees. So in the criminal justice system, there's restitution, um, which is when you, you pay back um, the, the person you allegedly wronged, right? And then there's the fines, which are actually considered punishment. But what we've seen is that the fees, right, which are, are not um, related to punishment at all, those fees have exponentially increased. And we've seen fees, you know, the police transport fees, case filing fees, electronic monitoring fees, drug testing fees. If you look at a single jurisdiction in a single county, I mean, you can read 200 different fees and a lot of these fees are not related at all to your case. So for example, you could have a traffic infraction, which um, is not even criminal, or you could have, you know, you could be charged with a misdemeanor um, DUI and be charged a DNA fee or a, you know, a police fund fee. Uh, and the reason that we're seeing all of these is that the legislatures in states have been faced with huge fiscal burdens and they're just not adequately funding the courts. They're not funding the judiciary. And in terms of mass incarceration, the way that this infect, affects mass incarceration is that what happens, and, and you'll hear from others on the panel, but, but what happens when you can't pay off these fees is that you then are saddled with interest fees. And you're sad, Washington State, for example, has a 12% interest fee on all of these types of criminal justice fees um, if you can't pay them. And so your license will get suspended if um, you can't pay these fees. You may get revoked from probation or parole if you have criminal justice debt on your record. Um, you can then be incarcerated. You can go back to jail. You can go back to prison um, for not having committed a new crime but just because you can't pay off this debt. So what happens is those fees become part of your conditions when you're on probation, when you're on parole. A probation officer meets with you and says, well, you're compliant, you're, you're passing your drug tests and you're going to work, but it looks like you're not able to pay off these fees. And in a lot of states, you can actually be, be jailed for that. Um, and we at the Brennan Center uh, you know, everyone here is working in their own way to improve these processes and improve outcomes for so many people who are impacted by criminal justice debt. Um, and at the Brennan Center, uh, we are working on a, a fiscal a project that I'm happy to tell you about more later after, you know, everyone else has spoken. Um, but we are hoping to bring more data to the conversation. So we are working on a multi-year, multi-jurisdictional project where we're looking at the costs and the revenues related to criminal justice debt. Um, so what we're doing is we are really looking at the balance sheets in these counties and in, in these states and we're asking, okay, what are the costs of collecting these, these fees and fines for the court, um, for all of the impacted agencies, the judiciary, the law enforcement, the probation departments, the sheriff's office. And then we're looking at the revenues. And we're, we're nursing this theory that 
in almost all of these cases, um, the revenue does not, will likely not um, be justified in terms of how expensive it is to levy these fees, to collect these fees. Additionally, we're also looking at, you know, the public policy aspects of this. Um, you know, we are saddling the poorest people in our criminal justice system with all of this debt, right? We're, we're creating this user-funded court system. So there are a lot of statistics indicating that 80% of defendants across the country qualify for indigent defense. Is that the population that should be funding the courts? So these are the questions that we're grappling with, and I'm happy to talk to you in more detail about the quantitative and qualitative methodology. Um, but you know, I'd love for, for all the other panelists to talk about what they're doing on this issue. Thank you, LB. And LB, do you want to mention just quickly the criminal justice debt report um, that folks mm -hmm. know can, is a resource? Sure. So I've, I've brought a few. Uh, of these reports, um, if, and they're also online. This is a 2010 report that we published that looks at the 15 states um, that house the most, um, the most prisoners in the nation. And this report indicates that almost every state looked at jailed people for non-payment of fees and fines, um, and also looks at you know, how this affects mass incarceration and that obviously this is a, a, a barrier to reentry um, criminal justice debt. And additionally, um, in the last year, we published this report called Charging Inmates Perpetuates Mass Incarceration. And this report goes a little bit deeper and actually looks at uh, the, fees and the fees that you're charged once you're incarcerated. So a lot of policymakers and the media um, and, and even you know, judges are aware of criminal justice set and the fees and fines on the front end of the system, um, but very few people are aware that once you're incarcerated, you're saddled with a lot more debt. You may have to pay 60 to $100 a day to be housed at the facility. If you're on work release, you almost always have to give a lot of that money back to the jail or the prison that's housing you. You have to pay for a lot of your toiletries um, and medical care. And Illinois is you know, one, one example of a state that will actually send you a bill when you leave prison and say, you've been here for two years, you owe us you know, $60,000, $100,000. Um, so this criminal justice debt, it, it doesn't end once you're sentenced. It, it really perpetuates. Um, at almost every stage of the criminal justice process. Thanks, LB. Um, and one of the things I also wanted to point out is um, we wanted to really put together a well-rounded panel so that you could hear from the various perspectives of all the stakeholders who have an impact on this issue. One of the areas where we were not able to, to uh, bring a panelist up with us was with respect to the judiciary. We really wanted to hear from one of the judges. I do know that we have some judges here in the room. Uh, I won't call them out. I'm smiling at some of them uh, right now uh, who I know are experts on this issue. Judge Donald. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> very good to see you. So when we get to the question and answer portion, we definitely would love to hear your input on these issues as well. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to Kiana, uh, because you know, Kiana, I always tell people that the heart of everything that we do as lawyers is really the clients that we represent. Uh, LB gave us a very good overview of what this issue is what it means, but you have lived it. We would love to hear from you what your experience has been in the criminal justice system as someone who has been impacted uh, by fees and fines. And talk a little bit about uh, how that's impacted your life and how that has impacted the work that you are doing now as an advocate. Um, well, it's impacted every... <clears throat> Um, it's impacted every aspect of my life. Um, for, for almost about 20 years now, I received my first traffic ticket um, maybe about 16 years ago, and I could not pay that. 
I would go to court every month and pay on it as much as I could. And on the merit of that, I received other traffic tickets. And, you know, I, I tried to turn myself in a few times to relieve myself of this debt. Um, they wouldn't take me. Most of the time, they wouldn't take me. They just wanted the money. I've been homeless. I've lived in my car. That was my purpose for driving. The school, my daughter goes to a great school, and they wouldn't pick her up, you know, wherever, whatever address or non-address we were at on any given evening. So it was very important to me um, that being the only constant that was in our lives, the only healthy constant that she get to school every day, and the only times that she missed was when I was locked up. For traffic tickets, nothing criminal. Mm, I wanna say a total of about six, five months in jail, if I add it all up over the years sometimes consec consecutive weeks at a time. Um, it's prevented me from going to school. I've tried to, you know, get an education. Maybe that would be my way out. I was arrested um, bef right before finals, and when I was released, I couldn't withdraw. It was past that deadline, so not only did I lose my dean's list status, I also incurred a fine that I'm currently trying to pay down so that I can return to school. It's affected me getting good jobs, earning living wages. Um, no one wants to hire you when you have warrants out for your arrest. I'm happy to be working for our city defenders now, the um, organization that helped me from this hole, um, and it just it feels good to help people who were in a position who were in a position that I once was in and am getting relieved of. Thank you, Kiana. You're welcome, Blake. Um, you work with Kiana and with other clients who've had similar. Uh, involvement uh, with the criminal justice system and who have been facing the hurdles brought about by fees and fines. Talk to us about some of the issues uh, that you, as an attorney representing these clients, um, have been working on. Um, what are the ways that you have to try to be creative and strategic to figure out how you help your clients overcome the, the hurdles of, of fees and fines and how you then help them to become reintegrated into the community such that they can become productive uh, and get the kinds of educations and home lives that so many of us strive for. Sure. Thank you. Um, so just to sort of lay out a little bit of the context, um, I work, as has been mentioned, at Arch City Defenders in St. Louis. St. Louis County uh, is made up of 90 independent municipalities. 81 of those have their own municipal court. And this is, uh, it's in these municipal courts that we have seen the greatest abuses around fines and fees and cash bail and the existence of debtors' prisons, of people being held in jail because they can't pay the various fines. Kiana's story, unfortunately, is uh, very common. It's something that we hear from our clients every day. It, in almost every case starts with uh, a very minor traffic ticket. Uh, failure to register a vehicle, failure to signal, maybe a speeding ticket, something that our clients can't pay. Uh, many of our clients are homeless. Um, all of them are poor, uh, many unemployed, <coughs> excuse me. M for many of them, the only source of income are federal uh, benefits. And so, you know, usually when I am sort of explaining to people our work, I start out and ask, you know, whether folks have had experience with traffic tickets and every hand in the room goes up. And once we get to the point where we start describing 
um, the experiences that our clients have had being held in jail multiple days, there's always this sort of cognitive dissonance between the infraction that they've been charged with and the penalty that they've, uh, or the punishment that they've been forced to endure. Lauren mentioned uh, in her comments that, that the sort of profit motive behind this in many of these municipalities, a lot of the attention in St. Louis came about post, after the killing of Michael Brown um, and was focused on Ferguson. In Ferguson, which is a city of about 20,000 people, the gross, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but I just looked at this the other day, the gross revenue that was being raked in the, by the municipal court was somewhere in the order of $2 million a year, uh, which is for a city Ferguson size and with its level of uh, income tax base is a very important source of revenue. I don't know if you know, Alex, off the top of your head, the percentage, but I think it was somewhere around that 25, 30% mark of the overall um, revenue for the city. And that's very common in a lot of these uh, frankly poorer cash-strapped cities in St. Louis County. So tickets, court fines, fees become a really important source of revenue and our clients bear the brunt of that. Our work has been focused both on the direct services in these 81 municipal courts in St. Louis County, going out, um, representing people in front of prosecutors that are seeking money that they can't pay, having indigency hearings, uh, to show the court that they can't pay the fines that have been assessed, um, getting charges amended and fines abated. And my work is actually primarily focused on civil rights cases, working with ALEC and other co-counsel to bring a number of class action uh, debtor's prison suits against now 15 different towns in St. Louis County. So in 2015, we filed four different suits for were actually filed before I even began uh, against Ferguson, Jennings, St. Anne, Velda City, four different municipalities in St. Louis County. Uh, and in 2016, we've now filed against another uh, 14, 15, excuse me. We filed two more this week, so we've been very busy. 15 municipalities in St. Louis County for the practice of jailing people who are too poor to pay fines and fees. Uh, we've seen in three cases at least, we've had settlements, one a class-wide class settlement against the city of Jennings for $4.75 million for a class of about 2,000 people, uh, which comes to a per diem amount of about 400 and, uh, 430, I think, dollars a day for people who were jailed for being too poor to pay fines. And it's not enough, it's not enough for people like Kiana who sat in jail uh, because of their poverty, but uh, it's the largest class-wide settlement uh, for a debtor's prison case that we've seen and we're using that as a building block going forward. In terms of the sort of direct service aspect and connecting people with social services and getting them in housing, um, this is sort of the front lines of our work, and uh, fortunately we have some relative success stories where we've seen people really go from um, living day to day in fear that they're going to be picked up, that they're going to be arrested in jail, taken away from their families, lose housing, lose jobs, um, not be able to return to school. Uh, we've, we've seen clients go from that sort of dire situation to having really stable housing and employment, um, being connected sometimes with a really crucial um, drug treatment, um, other social services through some of our partners, which are really important when we're working with uh, vulnerable communities. And uh, that remains really the core of what we do. I mean, it's really necessary, I think, when we talk about these broader issues of fines and fees to listen to the stories of people like Kiana, um, who, you know, hopefully you'll hear a little bit more about some of her specific experiences, but uh, only by listening to our clients have we even 
learn some of these broader systemic issues. And uh, I think that's, that's what continues to inform our work and what we continue to focus on on a day-to-day -day basis.